Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, we're continuing our Zhang Yi Mu series with his 1991 film, Raise the Red Lantern. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show and your favorite podcast app, or join us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you've ever wished for the spinach and bean curd, then it sounds like your diet is just right for The Next Reel's Instagram hashtag Guess the Movie Challenge. And with that, since Games Master Stephen Smart is busy eating his dinner of chrysanthemum moss hair, thrice fried mushrooms, and heart of cactus, I'll fill you in on who won this week. The movie was Trance, directed by Danny Boyle from 2013, starring James McAvoy, Rosario Dawson, and Vincent Cassell. Congrats to Ad Fegfi, who figured it out. And we've got a blot spot. A uh, friend of the show, Ben Lott, has written in with his rebound on Judo. Judo is visually beautiful once you get past the bad DVD transfer. The story is like a Shakespearean play and has a lot of good dramatic moments. I thought it was interesting how my opinion of the protagonists shifted as the movie progressed. It was a little slow to get started and might have been a bit too melodramatic, but I like Zhang Yimou's style. Your rank 80, my rank 101. Well, that's pretty close. I think that's a great start for this series. You know, I this is one I wasn't quite sure uh, 
what Ben Lott would think, but it's uh, yeah. great to hear that uh, that he enjoyed it. I love that he captured that word, melodrama. It's the one word I needed last week, but couldn't put my mouth on it. <laughs> melodrama. That climbing down the stairs head first. That's melodrama. Well, that's also <laughs> after you've been you know, sleeping in a pit of poison. <laughs> you know, potato, potato. Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. <laughs> Aftermath. So I looked at the trailer or the poster, I think, first of Aftermath, and the poster is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and he, doesn't it look like like the sequel to Maggie? I uh, have to look at it. It just has that look to it. Remember? You remember the Maggie uh, Maggie thing? It was very grim and sort of uh, sepia, and oh. and it was well, weathered Schwarzenegger. I'm looking at the wrong trailer. I'm looking at the... <laughs> Did you not even watch my trailer? <laughs> totally wrong po- no, I did, but I was looking at the the poster over on IMDb, but I was like, this doesn't look right. It's the the poster says Serpent Gods, Mega Storms, Doomsday Meteors, Mass Vanishings. I was That's like, not- what is this? And then I saw that it was the sci fi TV series. So That's, wrong aftermath. Not the one. Nope. Uh, anyhow. <laughs> No, you know, you know. Okay, now, yeah. now I'm looking at the right poster, and it actually reminds me of Paul Greengrass's. Uh, what was that movie that he did with Matt Damon? Yeah, uh, Green Zone. It looks like you know one of those uh, you know CCTV you know photos from. A okay, distance I can see character. that too. I can totally see that too. I think we're looking at different posters. I'm on the one on Wikipedia right now, and and it it the only thing different if you took the planes out of the picture we would it it look very much like maggie anyway it's a story it's actually a true story uh it it is a story of the uberlingen uh, mid-air collision uh, and the subsequent murder of swiss air traffic controller peter nielsen by russian architect vitaly kaloyev who held nielsen responsible for the deaths of his wife and two children in the disaster says wikipedia so i didn't know that what the first time i watched the trailer and i thought this is crazy who does this it turns out it's a true story and it really is a thing that happened this is the this is a mid-air collision on landing of these two planes and this guy uh schwarzenegger plays this guy who goes bananas and says that you know you need to apologize apologize for the death of of my wife and and daughter, and uh, it is a, an incredibly sad story, and uh, it, it <laughs> it's just really grim. Uh, it is written by Javier Goulon, who's a, he's a Spanish screenwriter, and we have actually talked about him as trailer picks. I think we may have done two of them. Uh, Out of the dark. Uh, was the first one an enemy, the uh, Jake Gyllenhaal uh, film. I think we've done both of those as trailer picks, and I haven't seen either one. Uh, man, we've got a long list of trailer picks to get through. <laughs> Gee, I need a better system of seeing these things. Uh, uh, anyhow, uh, right. so I, I think the trailer actually looks really good. I haven't quite come to terms with Schwarzenegger as his post-governor actor. Um, I, I enjoyed Maggie. I thought, I think it had some problems, and none of those problems were, in, in my head, res- related to Schwarzenegger. Um, and yet I still am not convinced that, um, of, of who he is as an actor now. Um, but Based on that, I'm absolutely willing to give this one a shot. How did it hit you? Well, it's so interesting. It's like his um, his post governor career. Other than like the cameos in the Expendables and stuff like that, it really seems like he's trying to kind of make a shift in his career, where it's definitely kind of the le- less of the action stuff and a little more character stuff, which I think is interesting for him to do. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious to see, um, I haven't seen any of the stuff that he's done really. Um, and so I, I, I don't know, I need to check some of them out and kind of get a read on, on how his, uh, how his acting career is holding up now that he's kind of jumping back into the fray, but it looks intriguing. I'm definitely intrigued by the story. I didn't uh, realize that the true story, uh, took place over in Europe. So, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting that they've gone the Arnold Schwarzenegger route, um, so yeah, it looks interesting. And 
you know, just to just in case people get confused, this is not <laughs> the aftermath. Another 2017 film that happens to be coming out uh, with Keira Knightley, Alexander Skarsgård, and Jason Clark. Nope, this is not that film. <laughs> Clearly, there are a lot of aftermaths out there. <laughs> uh, this one is due to hit the UK and uh, the United States April 7th of 2017, and Spain April 21st. Uh, those are the only release dates uh, on IMDb right now. What's yours? Well, I um, am looking at the uh, the teaser trailer that just came out for Sofia Coppola's new film, The Beguiled, which, um, you know, she's a, a filmmaker who I, who I find a really compelling storyteller. I don't always like her films, but I do think that she's bringing some interesting stuff to the table. And, and I mean, you know, we've talked about her acting career, and I think that... Um, I I think that uh, what she does behind the camera, I find much more um, appealing and interesting. This film, um, I have seen the Don Siegel uh, version of this story. It's based on a novel by Thomas Cullinan, um, and it's a it's about a Confederate soldier who gets imprisoned in this kind of Confederate girls' uh, boarding school. I mean, he's a Union soldier, sorry, and um, he kind of cons his way into. Uh, these girls' hearts, and and they start falling for him, and he gets them to turn on each other, and eventually they turn on him, and it's it's a really interesting story. And Don Siegel directed it with uh, Clint Eastwood, and I think it was Geraldine Page back in seventy one, and that version was really kind of um, uh, disturbing, and it was just really interesting uh, story that just kind of uh, really unsettled me, and. Um, what I think is going to be so interesting about this, at least I hope, is that now we're getting it from a woman's perspective. We have a, a strong female storyteller, Sofia Coppola, who's who's uh, written her own adaptation of this book, and and telling it kind of from uh, a perspective that we probably didn't get from the Don Siegel version, and uh, that excites me. I think it's going to be really exciting seeing how she takes this story. And uh, gives it her own spin. Uh, it's got Nicole Kidman, El Fanning, Anjuri Rice, Kirsten Dunst, uh, and then of course Colin Farrell as the soldier here. So uh, yeah, what do you think of this trailer? I thought the trailer was great. I, uh, I it starts out and it uh, I think to myself, I'm not going to like this movie. This looks like a Sofia Coppola movie. <laughs> and I'm not a huge fan, and so I'm not going to like it. And then it turns all thrillery, and then it gets scary. These right. girls are crazy, and I like it. Colin Farrell uh, uh, playing the uh, the victim role at the hands of these adorable girls, uh, I think, is really compelling uh, thriller stuff. So I'm I thought the trailer was really compelling. It was cut nice and tight, and it built intensity very well and very quickly and i thought it it worked very well for me i'm i'm definitely in well i'm curious to see uh how it plays it's going to be a summer film it's hitting right at the end of june uh limited release june 23rd and then um uh, it's opening wide june 30th so it's really kind of pushing as i guess uh, an alternate option for the uh you know pre 4th of july weekend with spider-man and everything so i'm curious to see how it ends up uh doing at the box office and then it goes uh, let's see france august 23rd sweden september 1st and italy September 14th. So it's going to have a kind of a slow rollout, but uh, I'm curious to see how this one does. Me too. Don't underestimate the foot massage, Andy. If you get one every day, you will be ruling the household. Raise the red lantern, Andy. Raise it. It's up. Is, I raised it, it already. It is up. Raise it high. You are the lucky winner, Andy. The Red Lantern's going in on your house. This is uh, Zheng Yimou's 1991 story of many wives and one faceless husband. The adaptation was done by Ni Zhen. It was a uh, late 80s, early 90s novel uh, that uh, uh, was adapted by Ni Zhen. Stars Li Gong, again, uh, a young woman married to an old man, again. And uh, and the story of her uh, adaptation uh, to this household and the other wives who live there. 
Uh, are, what did you think of it this time around? What? And are we are we calling her Lee Gong, or are we going to call her Gong Lee? Gong Lee. We're going to call her Gong. <laughs> we're going to call her. Gong. You know what the problem is? I just read the words. We're going to call the her problem Gong is Lee. the problem is this this crazy uh, language thing with the the Chinese putting the the surname first, and so you get Gong Lee, and then when you put it into like IMDb. They reverse everything, so it comes let out me, as let me, <laughs> let me be very clear, Andy. There are more than the, of them than there are of us. Therefore, we are I know. the crazy ones. I know. It's, well, it's just it's a world. It's going to be a worldwide problem. <laughs> it's just it is. Yes, it's, it is it's a impossible. global problem. And the frustrating thing is when there are ones that are done correctly that you know. Yeah. Okay, well, I know it should be Gong Li, at least the way that that we say it. <laughs> but then there are some where I'm just like, okay, but I'm seeing like. The author, uh, you know, uh, uh, is like Su Tong of the of the book is written as Su Tong, but yeah. not as Tong Su. So I'm like, wait a minute. So they didn't reverse that one. So is that one right? Or like, <laughs> then I start doubting. I know it. they totally yeah. mess you up. Yeah. Ah, uh, so really, this is IMDb's fault, and that's the that's the problem. It is. Let's just blame them. All right. Can we can we talk about this movie? What do you think? Let's about talk it? about this movie. All right. I love this movie. This is my uh, probably my favorite Zhang Yimou film. I hadn't seen it in probably as long as uh, it had been since I had seen Judo, but um, this one has just always stuck with me. And upon rewatching it, just uh, just instantly fell in love with it. Really fascinating story. I love the characters. I love the complexity uh, and the machinations going on within this uh, this house. And uh, and the tragedy of the whole thing. It's just a really uh, a really powerful story and just a beautiful film to watch. What do you think? I totally agree. It is beautiful. It is a, a tragedy of some really, I mean, a tragic story of this character. And it's a tragic critique of this sort of Chinese culture, this rigorous Chinese culture. And it is it is so beautiful. I can't I can't underscore that enough. It is beautiful, and it absolutely demonstrates Zheng Yimou's uh, affinity with the camera and using the camera as uh, another way to critique uh, to to provide a cultural critique or a character critique. It's just beautiful. And I was so bored. I was so bored through this movie, Andy. It felt like a 19-hour film. I could not get to the other end of it. I, I feel like it was just an exercise in... Um, in, in I, I, It pains me to say that, but I, this is not a movie I'm ever going to watch again because it was so boring. Ouch. It was so beautiful. It is so beautiful. And I... It's, again, I will watch... I, I would watch a few minutes of it to, to see how great he captures the house and the light, and there is, to me, there is no story here. I don't, it takes too long to tell me anything. And each of the elements going through each of the character exchanges between each of the other wives and the servants, I find so repetitive and boring. I know that I, this is me reflecting on my need for like a Hollywood ending, but I liked Judo, you know, I thought that, that was definitely not a Hollywood ending. Well, I, I'd say uh, that I, I would say the vast majority of critics probably agree with me, except for Hal yep. Hinson of the Washington Post, <laughs> who agrees with you, who said the story never amounts to much more than a rather tepid Chinese rendition of the women. No, I wouldn't go that we, far. How, Even you know I how that would not go with us. <laughs> I no, and you know I do. I I think there is so much to appreciate about this film, and you will absolutely get me every time uh, appreciating the way this film is structured. I I just think it did. I didn't connect with it, and I had seen this one before. It has been a very long time. I came at it remembering very little. I I remember flashes, and the stuff I remember is the stuff that is most intense at the end. I thought the movie was made up much more of of the the sort of style and pace of the the final sequence and. And uh, it, it turns out it's not. And it, it is a much more patient film. And for some people, that patience is good. And for me, it was super long. Also, wow. terrible transfer. Yes, man. What is up with these uh, Zhang Yimou films? They just, yeah. uh, they really need some love. It's just yeah, they, so they really do. So uh, we'll say maybe, maybe it would be better if it were a better transfer. How about that? So I'll hold out hope, I guess. <laughs> okay, there you go. Well, uh, you know, I, this is a a film that I mean, you're right. Zhang Yimou has this really 
interesting way to construct films. And and the way that he puts this film together, um, I mean, it is very slow paced. The, the shots are long and steady and still and very structured. I found the, the way that he organized the film, it is very much like the, the rigidity of the rules within the world. You know, you had just very um, still shots, very formal. Everything is just, you know, it's very Kubrickian the way that things are very centered and you have, you know, characters right in the middle of the screen with a, everything exactly composed perfectly around them. And that, uh, I, I think that lent a lot to the the uh, possibly that aspect of the storytelling that frustrated you is that it's just, you know, it is a very deliberately paced film as you're kind of moving through it in this world of these uh, these four concubines, these four wives of this master and the machinations they go through as they each try to get the Red Lanterns at their house for the night. And the Red Lanterns, if they get the Red Lanterns at the house, it means that he's going to spend the night there with that particular wife. Um, and it's just... It's very uh, interesting watching these these poor women who, uh, you know, I, I think what is so interesting for me is this transformation of Gong Li right at the beginning of the film. You get this uh, amazing kind of uh, single shot of her as she's kind of talking through uh, the frustration of agreeing to marry this this uh, rich person. And, and her mom's like, you're going to be a concubine. And she's like, why does it matter? What else is there for women? And it's just like this uh, resignation she has that she has to kind of suffer this this lot in life. And and once there, that's the only world we get. And we get this sense of these women. And it's the only power plays they can do now is against it, each other to get his favor. And I want to I throw in a note on that point, Andy, because I think it's actually fascinating that uh, it, it, the, the only example of uh, kind of the progressive... Uh, a more progressive fem- feminist identity in the film comes from the mother that we never see when she's actually trying to help the daughter make the case not to do what she's about to do. And as soon as we get into this house, all we get is the uh, is a regression uh, to this this sort of um, the the order of matrons and and oppression uh, in this house, and it it gets it, it only gets darker from there. Yeah, it's it's interesting because the mother, I, I mean, she's you know we, as as Song Leon uh, says, you know, the mother has been um, bugging her for three days, talking to her about getting married. This all happens. She's off in college, but her father dies, and mm-hmm. now she has to quit college and basically get married or something else because and apparently, that- yeah, and apparently in the book he commits suicide. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But yeah, so so you know, it's like her mother kind of talks her into getting married and she's the one who says, "Well, you always speak of money, why shouldn't I marry a rich man?" And so it's like she's doing exactly what the mother kind of alluded that she wanted her to do, but then the mother is just like, "You know, you're just going to be a concubine then." And I so, take it back. I take it back. I take it back. Yeah, right. It's it's interesting. I, I the way that that plays out, I think is so interesting. But um uh, yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I think is really fascinating about this, I mean, to your point, when she st- sets foot onto the grounds, she almost immediately loses her identity, right? She goes from Song Lian and, and, and gets this sort of uh, moniker of fourth wife, right? Or fourth sister. Fourth mistress. Yeah, fourth fourth mistress or fourth yeah. aunt or whatever they call, yeah. you know, they, they end up calling her. But it's, it's you know... F- more frequently, she is addressed by fourth something than she is addressed by, um, you know, by her name. Right? It, it's less. It, it's almost less than of an identity than it is for the servants who who have names, um, and and she, you know, doesn't as much. And I think that's a that's an interesting twist that we get. It's she is. It, it is a reflection that she becomes a servant herself. It's just a different kind of servant uh, in this um, in this environment. Yeah, no, and that is very true. Um, you know, you know, it's such an interesting character right from the beginning. I mean, we see this incredible shot of her at the beginning, but then, like, the next thing we see of her is her kind of walking to this house where she's going to, you know, get married to this guy, and she passes the um, uh, the bridal buggy or whatever it is, the bridal sedan, 
Um, and she sees them kind of uh, passing them, but she doesn't bother, you know, going back to them. She just kind of keeps going. And I think that says a lot about her character is that she's, you know, she's kind of uh, set in her ways and she's uh, pretty, you know, know, a powerful character. She has a good sense about her, but it's interesting to watch how that all changes once she gets to this house and, and how everything uh, become so different, and then she's she, you know, she is a strong character, and we see her um, very kind of uh, confused with this world. Um, but she's she's one of those characters who, um, because of the, um, uh, she's unsure and she isn't really doesn't really know what to do. She is very good at putting on this kind of air of confidence, and so she plays it up really well. I think so too. Talk a little bit about the about um, the the master, will you? Like, what is your sense of uh, of the strategy behind him? One of the 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 things that they do, one of the sort of visual tropes, is we never really see his face. Uh, what do you think that's all about? Well, I think that it's a, it's just an interesting way to um, really make the story about these women. I mean, he is this all important other that is the the one thing that all these ladies uh, focus their their whole world on. That's all they care about. Um, but it doesn't matter anything about him. Like, why does anything about him matter? He is just a, um, a husband that they have to do everything for. And so I think it's just a really interesting setup that says so much about this world that it doesn't matter who this guy is. What matters is the power plays that these women are going to be able to play against each other to curry his favor. Um, and I think because of that, it's made it open for a lot of people to really put their own interpretations on this film. I mean, Zhang Yimou has kind of de- denied a lot of the interpretations, but everybody looks at it as you know criticism of contemporary China how you know the the wives are a metaphor uh, for or the the um, the fragmented civil society of post cultural revolution China. Um, another critic, uh, James uh, Bernadelli, said uh, that Song Lian is the individual, the master is the government, and the customs of the house are the laws of the country. It's an archaic system that rewards those who play within the rules and destroys those who violate them. So I think the way that Zhang Yimou tells the story with the master being this kind of faceless man that these women are kind of um, doing everything to get the attention of allows people to uh, to put their some interesting interpretations on the film, which I think I, I think is a sign of a good filmmaker um, doing some interesting stuff with his story that allows people to dig like that. I think so too. I you know the house for me is is the thing I really latched onto. First of all, it's an amazing facility, right? It's one of these uh, fantastic courtyard houses, right? When you look at the Forbidden Palace, you know Empire of the Sun, right? Those are that is the biggest of the and the most amazing of the courtyard house. But this was the the sort of uh, you know the the vested landowner um, you know house of ages uh, in in this period and and for you know thousands of years they built these incredible. Uh, facilities like mazes of, of buildings that are all not attached to one another, only attached by pathways, right? And uh, and surrounded by a giant wall, and that wall is really symbolic, right? Because it's supposed to, when you take these, uh, when when the the owner of the house takes these women into the as, as his wife, the promise is, and the ideal, the sort of ideology of the walls uh, is is that it protects the women from all the ills of society, right? It keeps them um, it keeps them pure, it keeps them honest, it keeps them out of trouble, it keeps them healthy, uh, and all of those things. And then you have this film. Which shows a a palace that is apart from the red lanterns. It it shows a palace that is uh, gray, right? It's colorless. It's soulless. It is empty, but for the the servants that we see and these wives and the landowner that we don't actually see his face, right? It is falling apart. It is far from the aspirational sort of purity of the women who occupy these roles. In fact, all they aspire to is darkness. And and again, to your point about, you know, what we ascribe to this film, the meaning that we ascribe to this film is, you know, potentially is this a critique of the fall of the Chinese cultural value system, right? The fall of the communist value system. When we look at what is supposed to be so pure and such a, a, a grounded uh, foundational element of family 
that is actually falling apart. And and even Chen, the the owner, uh, it, it comments on it multiple times on on you know the way the women behave with one another. Uh, in the film, it it it's making a statement in and of itself. I can see why Yimou would not want to make any, uh, would not want to sort of accept any of the, you know, parallels that his filmmaking might have to the Chinese system. But it's kind of hard not to not to make those comparisons. Well, and it didn't help the film get uh, uh, banned. You know, I mean, the script had been approved and everything, but it still ended up getting banned for a number of years because yeah. uh, clearly people were able to see quite a bit of stuff in the film. Um, so, you know, I, I, it's interesting uh, the way that he uh, tells his stories. I think that he gets a lot in there. Yeah. And going back to what we talked about last uh, last week with Judo, this film is full of rituals and there's just so much uh, interesting stuff going on, all these traditions and rituals and, and just these things that people follow, the customs. It's it's such an interesting world. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about uh, that article that you brought up last week and just thinking about, you know, we are constantly talking about world building on this show. And it's like these are uh, nothing more than than other great tools that then a, a storyteller is using to kind of build their world. So, Again, it just kind of is like, you know, it irks me that article that you brought up because I'm like, There's, <laughs> it's, why can't a person put these interesting details in a story? It's, it was so frustrating. But uh, again, and this is full of this amazing world building. I, uh, this is, the, uh, to your point, exactly. I'm, first of all, I'm really glad that you were able to stew on that over the week because it makes me <laughs> yeah. really happy to bring a resource that causes you, that causes you some cycles. So- <laughs> so much consternation. Spent. Yes, consternation <laughs> on this. You, you know, the the I told you last week that the author had some problems, particularly with the the situation of the feet in this movie. You, you got to come to the feet with this movie because so much about um, sort of the the ritual starts with the feet. It start starts with how the feet are portrayed in the film, and um, you know the the wife, the new wife that comes in. Uh, we should talk, I think, briefly about the the rules of the of the uh, house that uh, each night, um, much like Oprah giving away a car, uh, it is announced which wife the husband will spend the night with. And whichever, <laughs> you get a red lantern, and you get a red lantern, and you get a red lantern. Uh, whichever, whichever wife that is, they light the red lanterns, and then they, they begin the ritual of preparing the wife, and they start with a foot massage, a highly ritualized foot massage that there's, there's little paddles, the, the like shakers that they like beat hammers, the yeah. bottom of the feet, yeah, these little hammers uh, that they beat the feet, they wash the feet, uh, and, um, and, and the foot massage is, you know, largely in this film replaced the, the binding of feet, which was, again, a, a sign of sort of um, sexual subservience, um, you know, smaller feet meant for a better sexual servant for the husband in many regards. Uh, and so um, that's that's what this is. The ritual leads specifically to a story element that is important for the film, right? And that's why the criticism that we talked about last week, that the foot massage actually uh, it, it simply celebrates a hyper-orientalization. It is a market-driven, uh, sensationalized view of the exotic orient that is merely designed to fill a hungry Western need for this exoticism. That's why I think this argument falls apart in this film, because if you don't have that, if you don't have that cultural, uh, the, the, the positioning of the feet as a cultural element, as a ritual element, I don't think you understand uh, as well what is going on in their relationship. And as you see all of the women sort of progressively, except for first wife, I think go through this in some way, shape, or form, you, uh, you get to see that they're all servants in that regard, even though they're taken care of, they're serving a specific need. I don't think you get it without it. I think you're right yeah. to be be frustrated. Uh, yeah, I mean, all of it. I mean, even down to the food, picking the meal, you know, because that becomes just as important. The, the wife who uh, gets the husband that night gets to pick the meal, and that becomes a, an issue of contention with Song Leon because she really wants her... Uh, what is it? Bean curd and spinach, or whatever yeah. it is. I can't yeah. remember. And uh, and uh, third wife wants uh, meat. You know, she doesn't want to just have a bunch of vegetables. And so it just is another interesting issue of contention. And I love how even we get a shot of the cooks in the kitchen 
annoyed by, you know, like these customs, but like everybody else, it's just like, well, you know, it is what it is. We just got to go along with them. It's, it's an interesting way to play like all of the stuff that these people live by, even down to, uh, the, the, uh, I can't remember what they called it, but the, the death house that's up on top yeah. of the roof. <laughs> Murder and, and, house. <laughs> right. The rules that uh, go along with that and, and, uh, you know, what, why, uh, somebody might end up back up in there. Uh, just a lot of really interesting things to keep everybody in line, to keep everything exactly as uh, as society, I suppose, says that it must be back in uh, 1920s China. You want to talk about about Yanner? Yanner? Yar. Sh- they always sh- say, y- yar is how it sounded like they would say it. Yar. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's kind of a swallowed yar. consonant. Yar. Yeah. Um, this is a it's a really interesting relationship. The, this is the character is uh, is Song Lian's maid uh, is also the first character that she meets who um, sort of shuns her. They have a little spat. They never really get on very well. Nope, never. This ain't no sisterhood of the traveling pants. I'm telling you that. <laughs> No, yeah, it, her, her, it's a really interesting relationship here. Uh, clearly, uh, it sounded like Yar had kind of thought she was going to be the fourth wife. Um, you know, I'm sure it was kind of a, mis, a misplaced hope for a maid to think that the master might pick her, when in reality, as we find out, the master was just uh, kind of sleeping with her. Um, and, uh, you know, it was an interesting uh, character uh, relationship between her and Song Lian, and how all of their, uh, just the, the animosity that Yar felt for Song Lian um, really kind of unfolded. And, and we learn, you know, that she has in her little maid's quarters, she has kind of taken all the red lanterns that have been broken and has created her own little uh, dream world surrounded by red lanterns where she's got her little voodoo doll <laughs> where she, for Song Lian and, and, and curses her and stuff. It's a really interesting relationship, and what I find so interesting about it is how that that really builds to that last moment where uh, Song Lian punishes her out in the courtyard, and, and just kind of like makes her kneel out there. And I, you know, I wasn't quite sure how to read it because I read the whole thing where uh, Yar collapsed, like Song Lian made her kneel out there um, and wouldn't let her get up until she apologized. And Yar refused to apologize until she finally collapsed and it led to her death. Um, but I did read an article that said that Song Lian just made her kneel in the snow and that was it. And I I mean, I'm not sure if I just misread the subtitles or forgot something. I wasn't quite sure. But the I think the 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 way that I read it, I thought, is a little more interesting because it's it says a lot about Song Lian that she would make her kneel out there until she apologized. And it says a lot about Yara that she would stay there and refuse to apologize. Yeah. And again, uh, well, and, and to your point, I think, first of all, I read it the same way you did. Uh, but I read it because that way because specifically when the, the first wife said, we're going to go by the old rules. Um, you know, you have to you have to do this until, and then yeah. later the head of the house came out and said, "Please just apologize, and you can come in." Yeah, um, right, yeah. And, right. So we have the mechanics all set up, but then she refuses to do it. And in the old system, before the fall of the the sort of Chinese cultural imperialism, uh, which I, you know, going back to the critique that this film I submit is actually supplying. Uh, she would have apologized, right? She she would have apologized. It's not something you don't you don't hold out for the will of of you know martyring yourself under that system. And so I think that is yet another example in front of these burning lanterns, representing yet another thing that is falling apart in this house inside these protective walls. It's deteriorating from the inside out. Uh, you know, it just keeps they keep giving us more and more information or more and more ammunition to support this cause that that something is wrong in China. Yeah, it was it's really interesting. You know, another thing I wanted to talk about that I think is uh, there's a conversation in the film that I think said a lot about the film and a lot about uh, just kind of the direction the story was going to go. There was a conversation between Song Lian and the third wife, um, Mei Shan. And it was about how 
women really don't amount to anything in this house. And it's all it's this this game that they have about having to fool the others. And if you can't fool them, you have to fool yourself. And if you can't fool you or yourself, all you can fool is the ghosts. And this whole idea that ghosts are people and people are ghosts. And it was a really interesting conversation about just kind of how the women are viewed in this place. And then as we get to the end of the story and Meishan gets uh, gets killed because of her affair that she has with the doctor and uh, and Song Lian goes into her place and lights all the lanterns and then everybody's convinced that there's the ghost of Meishan has come and, and uh, lit all the lanterns and turned the music on and she's singing and all this stuff. And then Song Lian goes crazy and is kind of wandering around. And that's how the film ends. It's it's interesting how this whole idea of people are ghosts, ghosts are people really kind of ends up uh, foreshadowing this ending where Song Lian kind of becomes Mei Shan's ghost and kind of her own ghost, uh, kind of this shell of herself as she's kind of wandering the, the, uh, the um, passageways uh, and kind of gone crazy. And I just think it says that, you know, this is this is this interesting world where if you can't fit into this system, it's just going to crush you and leave you this kind of floating outsider and you're not going to be able to uh, to be a part of it anymore. It's uh, I don't know. It's really haunting. But I, I, I like that they have that set up in there. I do, too. It goes back to this uh, the sort of, uh, I guess, the, the hierarchy of suppression of women's independence <laughs> over time in China right at this period. Uh, girls obey their fathers. Women obey their husbands. Widows obey their eldest sons. And when there are no more men around, elderly women just oppress younger women. Like they are those sort of uh, aspirations of suppression and, and oppression of, of will. It is a horrible thing. When you look at the, the major, you know, the, the women in this film, one of them ends up wandering around. Uh, as a sort of zombie, uh, the uh, one of them is remains the sort of I uh, you know crazed sort of dominant sex slave. One of them, we got a new one who's about to become that, the fifth wife. We know what she's about to become. And we have the first wife who has just become a shell of herself. They all end up being ghosts in their own sort of different way. This movie doesn't leave anybody left who isn't who, who you can't make a case is a, a ghost right, of their former self. And I, I think that's uh, that's fascinating. It's hard for uh, me to believe that Jang Yimou says that he wasn't putting any symbolism in the story. It seems to get harder and harder, right? <laughs> yeah. we talk. But uh, yeah, but I love that. And and I think you're right. He probably was saying some of that perhaps uh, in, in the context of his country um, trying to avoid it getting banned. And of course, it didn't work. But... Um, but I just think that it's uh, an incredibly powerful story, and uh, I, I love all of this stuff that it is saying. Want to jump into first shot, last shot? Sure, yeah. Uh, the first shot, uh, I've kind of already alluded to it, but it's a close-up of Gong Li as Song Lian in conversation with her mother, although we only ever see this close-up of Gong Li, which lasts uh, just over a minute, a single st- shot where she's pretty emotionless through this conversation, but you can really see she's trying to hold back some tears, which do finally come out at the end of this conversation, uh, right before some music fades up and fades to black. But this is the conversation where she's talking to her mother about, you know, she says, you've been talking for days, I'm going to get married, I'll marry a rich man, I'll be a concubine, all that. Let me be a concubine. Isn't that a woman's fate? As the tears drip down her face. And the last shot, we've got a series of dissolves of Song Lian pacing back and forth uh, in her zombied state. She's surrounded by her red lanterns, and she's actually wearing the same university uniform she arrived in when you talk about closing that loop. The shots of her get further and further away until we are way above the house, and we are looking down into the courtyard. Uh, you know, it says everything about uh, the structure of the society and how it takes a woman like this who is... Seeming to be um, a, more of a strong-willed person, but who's kind of uh, willingly kind of going to go along with the system and how the system crushes her. I mean, that's yeah. pretty much yeah. what we get here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> I, you know, I actually think it's really, uh, it, it, you know, in, uh, more than anything else, right? You just, I think you just made the point. But uh, this is one of those examples where it feels absolutely the first shot, last shot, absolutely intentional, right? The the way it opens on her and the way it closes on her and the journey between those two points is the journey of her just sort of uh, leaving behind a, a shell of what she was. Absolutely. Let's talk about the cast. Gong Li, a really powerful character uh, in this film. 
Uh, and it's uh, it is heartbreaking watching her driven mad. Um, it's you know, it's frustrating because this is one of those films where you could see it going a direction where she starts to understand the game and she gets knocked down, but she gets back up again and uh, she becomes the essentially like the matriarch of the house. You could see the story going that way, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's very it's very uh, heartbreaking and frustrating to see it take this turn uh, as we get into the third act where um, where uh, her friend gets killed and she's driven mad. It's not where we want to see this film go, um, but I think it really just says a lot. Um, uh, yeah, this is uh, another of her films that she's done with Zhang Yimou. This is her third film with him of his, uh, I think this is his fourth film. And uh, between Judo and this, she did a film called God of Gamblers 3, Back to Shanghai, which <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea what that is, but I just wanted to say that because the title sounds so crazy. <laughs> You know, isn't it interesting that of the of the and I didn't I certainly didn't see that either. I don't know if this one is <laughs> is actually fits, but this is the third. So these these three right, Red Sorghum and then Judo and then this one. Um, she is is cast as the the woman, uh, the young woman who is um, you know somehow wed off to the impotent old man. Uh, right. And and in this film, you know, the old man isn't necessarily physically impotent, but certainly he's lost control of his house. And and so it's a different kind of like that concubine system is he's lost control of that. And so um, it's I think that's a, a fascinating uh, uh, pairing why she keeps yeah. coming back for that role and why he keeps wanting to cast her in there. Well, I, they loved working together and they worked together quite a lot. So, um, uh, you know, she's just she's a really compelling actress. I really enjoy seeing her in films and I feel like I want to go revisit more of her filmography. And I was going to say, I'd love to see her uh, transition to some films over here in the States before I uh, um, remembered that she already had in the horrible uh, Michael Mann uh, uh, recreation of his old TV show, Miami Vice. Uh, She was in that. Um, Unfortunately, (laughs) such a terrible film. (laughs) At least I thought so. Uh, but she also was in like Memoirs of a Geisha, and so she had been in a few things. Um, and uh, I think it was funny. I was looking at her filmography, and she was in What Women Want, the Chinese remake of that old uh, that old film, uh, where it was it Mel Gibson, right? Where he starts hearing yeah. everything that women are thinking. Yeah, that was that was so. not a very good movie. <laughs> I never saw it, <laughs> but uh, maybe it's best that I didn't. It was not not very good. Is the thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, she's done. She's done a, a number, but it's funny. As, as much as as long as she's been around, and as much as she's done, she's only got thirty one credits to to um, her right now. I have to imagine that's more, and that is just the, that she's got more, and this is just we're seeing the the sort of uh, IMDb challenge of keeping up with all the Chinese titles is that possible it's possible you know it's it's interesting because when you look at the filmographies of the other uh actresses in the film a lot of their uh filmographies are incredibly short and mm-hmm. i think that could be for that very reason where uh like uh you know Kao kui fen who plays uh the second mistress i mean she's only listed with nine credits i don't know if that's exactly true but that's all she has on IMDb. It could just be that there's a lot more stuff out there. Hey, Cafe is Meishan, the third mistress. Uh, she's an interesting character because we go into the film not liking her. She is the character that uh, essentially we hate because of the way that she's behaving with um, with Song Lian uh, and uh, you know her first night with the husband and how uh, Meishan kind of. Uh, you know, play, feigns illness and uh, all this so that she can kind of steal him away. It's, it's, I find it such a fascinating character, the way that she does all of that, but how as the story progresses, we kind of learn that it's really the second mistress that is the one who's the dangerous one. And the third mistress actually becomes kind of the friend of Song Lian. And I loved that, that transformation in the film. I thought that was a great, uh, a great way to play with these characters. Uh, Kao Kuifen is Zhu Yun. She's the second mistress, the wicked one. And that's what I love about her yeah. because she is so nice. And she's just one of those people that you just want to hang out with because she just seems so sweet. And she's doing all this stuff for you. And she's giving you this this gorgeous silk and all this wonderful stuff. But really, she's the one who's like the most backstabbing and conniving. And 
it's a really interesting to see. And I like the way that they play that before and after uh, Song Leon finds out and how things kind of shift subtly in in uh, Cao Kuifen's performance. Uh, and then we've got Kong Lin as Yanner. Yeah, she was, uh, you know, I, I don't really have much to say, uh, but uh, it was a really interesting performance. Uh, uh, character and I liked the uh, the performance here. Probably the same for for everybody else is like they were really interesting performers. But looking at their credits and stuff, I just didn't get much. There's not much that I know about any of these people. But I really found them all compelling. The the only thing that I uh, the only one that I actually would wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, we've and we've got uh, Jin Chu uh, Jin Chu Yan as Yu Ru, uh, the first wife Ma Jing Wu as uh, Chen Zhou Quan, Master Chen, uh, uh, Chui Ji Zhang as uh, Dr. Gao, and then Xiao Chu uh, as Fei Pu. This is the oldest son, the master's oldest son. And this is the one point of story that I had a a problem with. Apart from being bored with the pacing of the film, this is a point of story I had a problem with. I feel like they teased us that there was going to be an illicit relationship between Song Lian and Fei Pu, and they never delivered on it. Yeah, and Am I, did you see that coming? I totally felt like I was going to expect something to happen there, and it never did. I guess it just never bugged me about it, but I, I could feel it. Uh, what was interesting about that, though, is I, I read something about the the original book, um, Wives and Concubines, and how there was more of that relationship that developed uh, with Fei Pu. I wanted that. I feel like either. Put it all in there or take it all out. I didn't need to see anything of Feipu in here. The flute scene was pretty, but really it, it didn't teach us anything that we didn't already need or know. You know, it's so interesting. I'm always curious about changes like that in a script because, yeah, I mean, she does have this. There is some interest in uh, with her character in Feipu in the uh, the book, Um is that a change that they had to make to the script to kind of keep it from getting uh, uh, banned uh, or, I guess, to allow it to go into production? Um, I'm curious about that and why that change might have happened or if that's just something that Zhang Yimou wasn't interested in. And I would yeah. love to know, but uh, never will. Alas. Uh, let's talk Alas. about uh, let's talk about cinematography because this is really where uh, Zhang Yimou you know, shines. We discussed last week. He was a cinematographer first. He is working here with Xiao Fei. Uh, what do you think of the cinematography? It's beautiful. I mean, this film is just, it's sumptuous. It's rich. The colors are gorgeous, uh, despite the horrible transfer. Um, I love the the way that the shots are so steady. Uh, there's just so little movement. The takes are long. Um, you'll get little pans here and there, but it's just, it's such a, a still film. And uh, I think that it really... Um, takes you to a place that's really uh, unsettling when finally when uh, Song Lian realizes what's happening in that little death room upstairs and they and he she sees them uh, taking um, uh, Mei Shan in there and after they leave she runs to it and all of a sudden you get this handheld camera just like this crazy handheld like shaking all over the place running up to that place and it was so unsettling it just really kind of you know, created an incredible tone. And so I think that uh, Zhao Fei, working with uh, Zhang Yimou, really knew how to work the camera in this film and and use it to tell the story. And it fits so perfectly in context of everything going on here. Well, yeah, and to your point, like that last sequence is the thing that I'm most excited about, right? At that point, I'm really, it's it's a very energizing sequence. And, you know, to the credit of Du Yuan, uh, editor, uh, and uh, Xiao Fei, obviously, uh, they, they end up doing this uh, superimposition of kind of three of the mur- sh- shots of the murder house as you're walking up, or as you're, she's running up to it. And it, it ends up really make, being that substitute for the even more aggressive shaky cam, the, the truly jiggly monkey shaky cam that I, I I think it, it works in that sequence really, really well. Um, it, it's, as you say, it is really unsettling. Um, the production design, uh, Cao Chui Ping, the, you know, art direction, incredible facility and the gorgeous lanterns. It was filmed at the uh, Chao family compound uh, near the city of Ping Yao. And uh, it was just a perfect location for this. And I think uh, what Cao Jui Ping uh, brought to the sets was just uh, uh, perfect. And for a film called Raise the Red Lantern, 
obviously lanterns are going to play a key part in your story and, and the man, raising just, of them <laughs> and the raising of them and i just loved the lanterns they were just so gorgeous and they were such it's just like when a room was filled with those lanterns it was just bathed in that red light i mean it's just like oh man just it's so intense and just beautiful it just it was so uh, just rich i really just was so impressed also with the costumes by uh tong um wa Miao, i just thought uh just stunning i mean everything just really was just uh, a visual feast and i think that's something i have always loved about Zhang Yimou films um even if it's a film where the story might not uh engross me as much as some of the other ones i still just find them just so visually stimulating and just enjoyable to watch other thing i had trouble with in addition to the pacing was the music. Now, I know you love the music. I know <laughs> I you do. I love the music. I totally my God, man. I felt, like, I felt like Xiao Jiping was in my head banging on those drums <laughs> by the end of the It was just, <laughs> it happened so often. I thought I was closing my head in a car door repeatedly over and over. It was too Which much. It's so funny because as soon as <laughs> I finished watching the movie, I ran and I bought the soundtrack because I just wanted to listen to it. <laughs> Over and over. So good. Oh, man. Just the, the beautiful choral work in the film that, yeah, that clanging, the, just the intensity of the clanging. Yep. Everything was just, uh, again, it just, I don't know, it just it wrapped me into the world. I completely loved what Zhao uh, Jiping <laughs> did here. So, <laughs> How did the, how did the awards season? Did the awards agree with you? If this film uh, did do really well at award season. Um, it did get for Oscars. It got nominated for best foreign language film. It lost to Italy's Mediterraneo. But I mean, this was a, a just one of these films that just um, was received really well. I mean, at the Venice International Film Festival, Zhang Yimou won the Silver Lion. The film was nominated for the Golden Lion. Uh, you know, the Boston Society of Film Critics, uh, Independent Spirit Awards. Uh, all these different critics, uh, Lo- uh, Los Angeles, the National Board of Review, National Society of Film Critics, New York Film Critics, uh, it just it just was praised left and right, and it ended up winning most of the things it got nominated for. It, so it really was something that people loved. And if you look at uh, just kind of after the fact, uh, it's on a lot of best of lists, um, you know, best of the decade, um, best, uh, you know, best foreign film. Um, you know, Empire has a 100 best films of world cinema, number 28. So uh, this is a film that I think a lot of people uh, who have seen it just really fell in love with, were struck by what they what they saw here, other than our friend Hal Hinson at the Washington Post and you. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Hal. Oh, brother Hal. <laughs> uh, now, I, I assume this one was equally challenging when it comes to the budget. It was, uh, yeah. They uh, there was no information for this uh, about the cost or the gross, other than here in the states. Unfortunately, uh, the movie did have a limited release here, and when I say limited, it looks like it was just uh, one theater, March thirteenth, nineteen ninety two. That was the weekend when Article ninety nine, American Me and My Cousin Vinny debuted. Um, that was when it opened. It did end up having a slow expansion because people did find it so uh, captivating from March through October. So quite a number, quite a long period of time for it to kind of have slow openings around the country playing. It, if I, it, the biggest um, point in time, it, it was playing in about 40 theaters. Went on to make about $2.6 million here in the U.S. box office, which is about $4.5 million in today's dollars. And unfortunately, that's all I have for this one. Then I think we should head over to Flickchart and rank it, Andy. Let's do it. Flickchart.com, you can just swipe up in your podcast app of choice, and you will see the link right there for Raise the Red Lantern on Flickchart. Just tap it. It will take you right to the movie where you can add it to your collection. And and let's see. I I just want you to know, Andy, going in, I recognize the greatness of the film, even though I didn't like it. This is going to be a hard one. There's going to be a lot of fighting. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm trying to tell you. I, I didn't come to fight. There are a few that I'm going to have to lay down the, 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 the fight, but but not. I didn't come to just to fight you. Uh, well, this. let's see. <laughs> First up, <laughs> we have Raise the Red Lantern or Mad Max. Raise the Red Lantern for me. <laughs> <laughs> See, um, I, <laughs> no, and and let me tell you, let me justify this because I know I was bored, and just because it's in the top half of our own list doesn't mean I have to watch it again. 
So <laughs> I'm going to give it to you on the basis of the fact that it's gorgeous and a lot of, and I really enjoy talking about it. I think it is a valuable film to exist. Okay. And I don't need to watch it anymore. <laughs> All right. Raise the Red Lantern or Trading Places. Raise the Red Lantern. <laughs> <laughs> waiting it out. See, now here I would be trading places, but I also recognize uh, what what the film means, Andy, and I give it to you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I was going to have to bring up Dan Aykroyd in blackface. <laughs> you don't you don't you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Uh, all right. Raise the Red Lantern or Aliens. I'm going I will to say, say Aliens. Aliens. Yes, yes. There we go. Do you see, see how easy that was? This has been very easy so far. Raise the Red Lantern or L.A. Confidential? L.A. Confidential. I'm going to say L.A. Confidential. Yes, you are, sir. That's right. See, we are gentlemen. <laughs> Raise the Red Lantern or My Neighbor Totoro? I, I would... Totally uh, different. They put me in totally it, yeah. different places. <laughs> they really... I mean, that's just remarkably different. They're both uh, gorgeous works of art. I would say Totoro, but I can go either way. I'm going to also say Totoro. Okay. Look at that. I, know. I did I not was see that coming. So much more fighting. Well, I, you know, I mean, they're both like uh, top-notch films for me. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just a different place for that one. Uh, Raise the Red Lantern or The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, right from our uh, previous series. Mm -hmm. I would stick with Priscilla. I will stay with, with Priscilla also. <laughs> I'm I'm more surprised at you than I am myself, sir. Well, I guess it was those two that you gave me that uh, <laughs> that really could have helped. Uh, Raise the Red Lantern or The Social Network? Oh, The Social Network. I, I'm probably going to say Social Network, even though uh, I, they're both just really such great films. Um, I I likely would watch Social Network uh, more often, but uh, and Raise the Red Lantern is more beautiful, but I'll say Social Network as well. Okay, there we go. Ah, Raise the Red Lantern or Shaun of the Dead, well, which I, also has a lot of red. You got red yeah. on you. <laughs> I'd love to have somebody raise the Red Lantern and say that. <laughs> <laughs> you got red on you. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I was going to say raise the Red Lantern, but because you made the funny, I'm going to go with Shaun of the Desert. Or <laughs> Shaun of the Desert. <laughs> Shaun, Shaun of the of Dead. The desert. Uh, totally Shaun of the Dead for me. Yeah. I love that one. Uh, raise the Red Lantern or Seven Samurai. Seven Samurai. I I can see why this one might give you pause. Torn. I'm yeah. really torn on this one. <laughs> Seven Samurai is sure is long. That's what keeps going through my head. <laughs> and this one sure <laughs> feels long. Um, I'm gonna go with uh, I man, I don't know. I guess I'm gonna go with Seven Samurai. I'm really, I could almost go either way on this one. That's a tough battle for me. Uh, all right. Well, that leaves Raise the Red Lantern at number seventy three. On our chart, which is a, a, a great spot for it, I'd say. It's a fine spot. <laughs> <laughs> can, can we agree? agree to agree? It's a fine spot. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much agreeing going on. What What does this do for your letterbox? <laughs> this is absolutely a five star film for me. All right. Well, this on on this point we will disagree. I this is this is a two and a half star film for me. Two and a half. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's right. Are down you the kidding? I kid you not. And that half star oh. is Andy Love. Like that's just for you, straight up. Wow. Yeah. That is so surprising. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like floored that it's so low. Uh, you, you, know, you you dumbfounded me a bit there. I did. I you know well I like to keep you guessing. I, I guess I did so. not. I did not connect with this film. We've talked about this before. Sometimes, you know, you just have to be in a space. Maybe that was it. But I, I did not remember feeling this way about this film the first time I saw it. I, but, but I really want to highlight the the incredible artistry that it, it that went into this film and the vision of the film. Even though I didn't really like it, uh, it is absolutely worth seeing. But maybe wait for the Blu-ray. <laughs> Fingers crossed for me. <laughs> right? One day, one day. Uh, where does this take us next? We're, we're, uh, we've got uh, one more Zheng Yimou before the most current Zheng Yimou, which will end our series. Right. So where do we right. go next week? We're going to bridge the gap between the two. Yeah, we're jumping ahead quite a bit in his career. Uh, we're skipping over uh, a number of films. The Story of Kyuju, To Live, Shanghai Triad, Keep Cool, Not One Less, The Road Home, and Happy Times. We're landing in 2002 
to pop, talk about his first foray into action films, Hero, with Jet Li, Tony Leung, Maggie Chung, Zhang Ziyi, and Donnie Yen. Fantastic cast, great film, very much looking forward to it. The interesting thing is it came out in 2002 um, over in Asia. It wasn't until 2004 that it finally got released here. When did when was, cr- when was Crouching Tiger? 2000. 2000. Okay. That was that that kickstarted it. Yeah, that kind of kickstarted the uh, the Wuxia uh, interest that people had yeah. over here. Well, I am very much looking forward to talking about that film. I uh, yes, let's just say very much, especially after this <laughs> film, very very much. Uh, so that's uh, that's what I got. I I I, I really. I, it, it wore me out, this film, and now I think you know, Andy. I gotta go to bed. All right, well, you do that. Uh, unfortunately, I can't until I get my foot massage. Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always doeth. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I'm going to go ahead and and tell you mine. Can I? <laughs> you tell me yours. This there, there's not a lot of uh, one or two star uh, uh, reviews for this film because everyone loves it, Pete. <laughs> there is zero value to the one or two stars. They're all about how bad the DVD is, how bad the the, the transfer is. It's terrible. It's that bad. It's that yes. bad that even Amazon reflects how bad it is. Even Amazon. <laughs> Mine is, uh, which I think I can, you can tell, I picked it mostly for the title. Uh, it's yes. five stars. Five out of five. Girls Gone Wild, communist style. <laughs> Who writes that stuff? So there are no young teenagers ripping off, ripping anything off for the cameras, thank God. But there are four women who are all concubines of a very rich businessman. And the things they'll do for his affection are cold, calculated, and just plain great to watch. The drama is a well-paced ride through the youngest concubine's entry into the new family to her breakdown a year later. How could that be boring? One day you're in college, the next day you're on your back. Eh, enough to drive anyone insane. Without spoiling anything, I will tell you there are lies, plots, hangings, bloodshed, drunken betrayal, and so much more. My favorite foreign film ever. (laughs) Asked a lot of leading questions in that review. I'm going to go ahead and withhold answers right now. A lot of leading questions. That's just fantastic. Communist well, I've style. got a three star. Uh, I, I went with a three star that that uh, you know again there aren't really even that many good three stars. They all talk about the quality, and this one does too. But I just I liked it because uh, the well one Jeannie wrote about it. The format apparently was a VHS tape, but her her, her review says the DVD quality was good, but there were no subtitles. <laughs> I watched it anyway. I had somewhat a sense of the story. <laughs> Clearly enough to give it three stars oh, still. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. <laughs> oh, jeez. Thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, I know. You're telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. In Season 6, our Disease Films series had adaptations like The Omega Man, based on I Am Legend, The Andromeda Strain, Children of Men, and Blindness. I Am Legend is so much better than The Omega Man. What about the Will Smith version? Don't get me started. For our This Is Real Life Jack series, we talked Black Hawk Down and Seabiscuit. Some great true stories based on fantastic books. And we had more listeners' choices like The Fly, The Emigrants, and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. You just did a series on The Fly on the Sitting in the Dark podcast. Did you read the original material? Wasn't watching every Fly movie enough? (laughs) Our Big Betty Davis series featured adaptations like The Little Foxes, Now Voyager, All About Eve, and Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Are you calling Betty Davis big? 
only in personality and force. She is a force to be reckoned with. We talked about the entire The Godfather trilogy, of course. Iconic page to screen, even if it is just the one Mario Puzo book. I wonder if Coppola will ever make the Sicilian. We also had some Zhang Yimou adaptations with Judo and Raise the Red Lantern. Absolutely gorgeous movies. And don't forget the Hughes Brothers series with From Hell, based on the graphic novel. Brilliant material. Kelly Reichardt gave us Wendy and Lucy and Certain Women, adapted from short stories. Plus more Hayao Miyazaki as we tackled Howl's Moving Castle. Find all these books and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the show. Get the full list of adapted films that we've covered at thenextreel.com slash originals and start your next read today. <laughs>